think of God as being impersonal, they think he may be light, they think he's uh, some kind of uh, form, uh, not, not form, but some, he doesn't have a form. Some people worship fire as God. They think of God like that, some kind of energy, a, 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 a great light. So, of course, God, God has energy, but he's not limited to just energy. And it's wrong to think that he's lost his personality. Pro, the other argument Prabhupada gives is that, that, he, that because God is everywhere, so he could not be in one place. He must have put himself everywhere, so how could he be in one place? But they don't understand the great potency, the unlimited power which God has. So this is the point. This section of the Ishopanishad is pointing out to us how the Lord has these inconceivable powers. And we want to understand Him. We cannot understand with our limited mind and senses. But we can hear, he can describe, he can reveal himself to us, he can describe himself to us. In this way, we have to understand. As Prabhupada says, our own limited potency, we cannot approach him. But if, if God wants to, he can reveal himself to us. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone read please in the Bhagavad Gita. Is, is Patita Pavan Goranga, the, the Patita, Va, Papita, Patita Pavan Chaitanya there today? Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes Maharaj, I'm here Maharaj. Oh good, could you read for us Prabhu in the Bhagavad Gita 10.2? Yes Maharaj, in the Bhagavad Gita chapter 10 text 2, <clears throat> the Lord says that not even the great rishis and suras can know him and what to speak of the asuras for whom there is no question of understanding the ways of the Lord. This fourth mantra of Sri Yusopanishad very clearly suggests that the Absolute Truth is ultimately the Absolute Person. Otherwise, there would have been no need to mention so many details in support of his personal features. Can, can you tell us what we mean by suras and asuras? Suras uh, refers to devotees uh, following the, the path of devotion and asuras are those who are not following the path of the scriptures, Maharaj. Okay, yeah, fine. Go ahead, can you read a bit more? Yes, Maharaj. Although the individual parts and parcels of the Lord's marginal potency have all the symptoms of the Lord Himself, they have limited spheres of activity and are therefore all limited. <clears throat> the parts and parcels are never equal to the whole, therefore they cannot appreciate the Lord's full potency. Under the influence of material nature, foolish and ignorant living beings, who are but parts and parcels of the Lord, try to conjecture about the Lord's transcendental position. Sri Isopanishad warns of the futility of trying to establish the identity of the Lord through mental speculation. One should try to learn the transcendence from the Lord Himself. The supreme source of Vedas for the Lord alone has full knowledge of the transcendence. Okay, so Prabhupada's making the point. We have to learn about Krishna, about the Lord. We have to learn from Him. It's not possible for us to try to understand Him or to, to give some ideas or philosophies about him, we have to hear from Krishna himself. He can explain his position. We are, we're very limited, we're very small, but he has full potency. We have a very small potency, so we don't have the capacity to understand him our, ourself by our own efforts, but he can reveal himself to us. Okay, could you go ahead, Prabhu? 
Yes, Maharaj. <clears throat> Every part and parcel of the complete whole is endowed with some particular energy to act according to the Lord's will. When the part and parcel living entity forgets his particular activities under the Lord's will, he is considered to be in Maya, illusion. Thus, from the very beginning, Sri Ishopanisha wants us to be very careful to play the part designated for us by the Lord. This does not mean that the individual soul has no initiative of his own, but he is part and parcel of the Lord. He must partake of the initiative of the Lord as well. When a person properly utilizes his initiative or active nature with intelligence, understanding that everything is the Lord's potency, he can revive his original consciousness which was lost due to association with Maya, the external energy. Okay, so this is interesting. Prabhupada is talking about how we fall into Maya. What happened? How did we fall into Maya? Someone like to say? Anybody there? Listening? You can tell us how did we how did we come into Maya? What happened? And we forget about our ourselves, our real identity. Yes, what's a real identity? We are the spirit soul and the servant of the Lord. Yes, we're the servants, right? We're the part and parcel of the Lord. And the relationship is the master and the servant. And when we forget that, what happens? What are we thinking? We think that we are the master. Yes, we're thinking I'm the controller, I'm the master. We're thinking it's all mine. <laughs> okay. So then Prabhupada talks about initiative or he describes it as our active nature that he said he said we we should use our initiative he said uh, becoming a devotee doesn't mean that we have no initiative of our own we have to we have we do some have, we have initiative we have this active nature but we have to use this initiative properly right so how to use this initiative? What should we be doing? Prabhupada said when the person properly utilizes his initiative with intelligence. So how do we make proper use of this initiative? Understand that everything is Lord's potency, Maharaj. Yes, yes, it's mentioned there. Understanding everything is the Lord's potency. Yes. So we must have. Uh, yeah, yes. Quite. We must inquire who is the uh, absolute truth and who are we and what is our relationship with the supreme absolute truth. Yes, yes, we have to understand, we have to understand, Prabhupada says, our original consciousness, right? Our, our, what is our pure consciousness? So how do we do that? How can we revive our original consciousness? By chanting Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, that's one way, right? Chanting Hare Krishna or simply engaging in devotional service and surrendering to Krishna. Yes, what did you say? What did the lady say? Engage in devotional service, Maharaj. Yes, engaging in devotional service, right. We have to surrender ourselves, utilize, use our body, mind and words in the service of Krishna. Become the servant 
and stop trying to be the master. So that's proper use of the initiative. The in we can use our initiative to think also how to serve Krishna, right? To think how to, how to serve Krishna, we can think about how to distribute Krishna consciousness or how to serve Krishna. Maybe you have a deity or maybe you're worshipping Krishna at home. You can think about how to serve him more. Use your, our initiative like that. We will, we will get a, we will grow Tausi, we will keep a Tausi plant at home because Krishna likes Tausi very much. Then we can also offer le use leaves when we make offerings to Krishna. These kind of things. Use our initiative about how to distribute Krishna consciousness, how to give Krishna consciousness to others. Maybe you do kirtan, you go for sankirtan, or you go for book distribution, these things. Hmm. You begin a bhakti briksha program. This is using our initiative for the service of Krishna. So Krishna likes us to use our initiative, but use our initiative for the pleasure of Krishna, not for our sense gratification. Okay. Go ahead, so, someone else like to read? One of the ladies can read? You can. All power is obtained from the Lord. Therefore, each particular power must be utilized to execute the will of the Lord and not otherwise. The Lord can be known by one who has adopted such a submissive service attitude. Perfect knowledge means knowing the Lord in all his features, knowing, knowing his potencies and knowing how these potencies work by his will. These matters are described by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita, the essence of all Upanishads. Okay, so Prabhupada saying, we want to know more, we need to know everything about the Lord. Of course, we can never know everything about him because he's so great, he's so unlimited and he's always increasing and expanding his power and his glories. But we want to know, try to know more about him, that's the idea. All of his features, different features, his potencies, his different incarnations, his different pastimes. So th this is how we can understand more about the Lord. Reading books like Bhagavad Gita, Krishna book, and this will help us to know more about Krishna. Okay, any questions on mantra 4? No questions, we'll go ahead, mantra 5. Who would like to chant for us this mantra? Who have we got? Let me f your names are so beautiful, you know, it's so nice to, to call your names. I, I feel Every time I'm calling the names of these different devotees, I'm thinking, wow, so wonderful names. All Krishna's different names. What about Taruni Champakalata? Is she here today? Taruni? No? What about Tanosha? Tanosha Sevalingam? Krishna Maharaj. Yeah, you're here, eh? you're good. Uh, yes, Maharaj, I'm here. <laughs> Can you chant? Are you able to chant this mantra, the Sanskrit verse, one line at a time? We will repeat after you. I will try, Maharaj. Tad e jati, tad nai jati. Tad e jati, tad of antika, antike, tad dure tad vantike, tad antarashya sarvashya, tad antarashya sarvashya, tad u sarvashya shabayata, tad u sarvashya bayata, bayata. 
Okay, very good. Read the translation now. The Supreme Lord walks and does not walk. He is far away, but he is very near as well. He is within everything, and yet he is outside of everything. Have you heard anything like this before? Does it sound unusual? No, Maharaj, it, it does not. It does not sound unusual to me because only the Supreme Lord can do this. Oh, okay. He can walk, but he does not walk. What do you mean? Um, which means that he can do simultaneously. Oh. Some. You mean he can walk and he doesn't walk sometimes. Uh, no, maybe he can walk and at the same time he, he does not walk as well. Yeah, yeah he doesn't walk like us, right? <laughs> he's not walking like us. He's, he can walk, but he's not walking like us. What about far away, but he's very near? Uh, it means that um, he's far away means that he's in the spiritual world, but he... But he is very nearby as well because he is in our heart. Okay, yes, good answer. And he is within everything, but he is outside of everything? He is within everything, meaning that uh, in each and, each and every puzzle, I mean each and everything in this material world, he exists. Yeah, he is within everything. He exists and... How is he yeah, within he, everything? In and out he is there. Huh? And outside? In and out he is there much. Outside of everything. Is outside of everything where? Outside of everything means... Uh, meaning that maybe in... in uh, maybe in, since we are in human life, maybe he is in the... And maybe he is in the like... Animals, plants, in each, in uh, other than human life, like for example, non-mobile things well. and books. <laughs> okay. Well, I think it's a little different from that. He's, we could say he's within everything. Yeah, as you said, he's a super soul. He's a paramatma in the heart of everyone. He's within every atom. Within every atom, so he's within everything, but he's outside of everything also. He's outside of everything because he has his own abode in the spiritual sky in Goloka, Goloka Vrindavan. He's also there, so that's outside of the material world. So that's how I see it, anyway. Anyway, yeah, go ahead. Can you read the purport a little? Here is a description of some of the Supreme Lord's transcendental activities executed by his inconceivable potencies. The contradictions given here prove the inconceivable potencies of the Lord. He walks and he does not walk. Ordinarily, ordinarily if someone can walk, it is illogical to say he cannot walk. In the reference to God, such a contradiction simply serves to indicate his inconceivable power. With our limited fund of knowledge, we cannot accommodate such contradictions and therefore we conceive of the Lord in terms of, the, of our limited powers of understanding. For example, the impersonalist philosophers of the Maya Vada school accept only the Lord's impersonal activities and reject his personal feature. But the members of the Bhagavata school, adopting the perfect conception of the Lord, accept his inconceivable potencies and thus understand that he is both personal and impersonal. The Bhagavatas know that without inconceivable potencies, they, there cannot be no meaning to the words Supreme Lord. Very good. Thank you very much. Very nice. Okay, so this is very important for us to understand. Srila Prabhupada is explaining that when you have these contradictory kind of statements made, like it's here, he walks and he does not walk, you know, it appears to be a contradiction. 
but Śrīla Prabhupāda explains, this indicates his inconceivable potency. And certainly God has inconceivable powers because he's the Supreme Lord. So his powers are just beyond our comprehension, very difficult for us to understand. It's inconceivable. But there are such things as inconceivable powers. Just like if we look up at the sun, we see the sun gives off so much heat. We know in Malaysia you get so much sunshine, hot there, you, sh you get a lot of sun anyway. And so every day, just think for how many millions of years the sun has been shining and giving off so much heat and light. There's no comparison to an ordinary source of heat. If you make a fire, you have to put fuel on it all the time. But there is the sun, the sun planet, and it's so far away, but it's producing so much heat and light. And it's been doing that since the beginning of the creation. So this is an example of inconceivable power. You know, because p people will ask you, people will say, you know, you know, can, do you believe these things? Can, do you believe inconceivable? We don't. So we have to be able to give examples of inconceivable power, how there are things like that in the world, and we see them every day, but we're not aware. So we want to point out to people that there are such things as inconceivable power. And the sun is one very good example of that power. Uh, We see the scientists, they, they make, they have power, they can build airplanes to fly in the sky and the airplane can carry hundreds of people at a time. So it's, in, you know, we think, oh, very great that the, 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 it can, the, the scientists can make an airplane which can fly and can carry 300 people or so. But the Supreme Lord, he can make planets which can float in space. And just look at the planet, just look at our earth planet, which is one of the smaller planets. Look at what's on the earth planet. There's so many people, there's so many buildings, and there's so many mountains and oceans and so many things all around the planet. And the Supreme Lord is arranging for this planet to float in space. It's floating in space. And it, it, somehow it's, it's moving at a, at a high speed. It's very, the, the, the speed of rotation of this planet is very high. But we have no indication, we, we're not even aware of the movement. Just like when you ride in a, if you have a very good car, then when a very good car, you don't notice the bumps because the car is so good. You know, you go in, the, when the, the old cars, when you're in the old car, you're shaking, shaking, or like the old trains, the old railway, you shake a lot, very bumpy. But here we have the planet, it's re revolving at a very high speed, we're not even aware of it. It's inconceivable, this inconceivable power, how the planet is revolving, we're not even aware. And, then, and at the same time it's rotating in perfect orbit. Everything is predictable. The seasons, at a particular time they come, the day and the night, everything is very regulated. So there's, there's so many powers there. Who, who arranges all this? It's inconceivable to our tiny brain. But there's a, there's a supreme intelligence behind the universe. So the, the Upanishads 
are helping us to understand this personality who is behind the creation. So these contradictions help us to understand something of his nature. So Prabhupada mentions about the Mayavada or the impersonalist philosophers and how they think of God and they reject that he could be a person. They just simply think of only the oneness of the, the Brahman, the energy. And they're thinking like that only of an energy, an impersonal energy like the heat or the light. But Prabhupada points out energy has to come from some place. Just like you have your energy, I have my energy, we all have our own individual energy, the same way the Supreme Lord, He also has energy and He uses His energy to maintain this creation. Not only maintain but for the purpose of creation, maintenance and ultimately destruction. It goes on continually in the nature of the material world subject to the three phases of time. So the impersonalist philosophers, they simply think of everything as being without a personality. But we say God is both a person and also impersonal. He's everything. If we say, oh no, he cannot be impersonal, then that would mean he is lacking something. But everything is there within the Lord, everything. So he is both personal and impersonal. One time some reporters came to Prabhupada and they were doing, a, they had some questions, you know, all about different philosophies and things and they were asking Prabhupada. They asked Prabhupada, he said, they said to Prabhupada, in India we have two main philosophies. One is called Advaita. Advaita is the, the oneness, in other words the impersonal. And then the other is the Dvaitis, dualism. That there's two. There's not one. There's two. There's God and the living entity. And they're different. So they asked Prabhupada, who's right? the Dvaitist or the Advaitist? And Prabhupada said, they're both right. Let them both chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Prabhupada answered like that. So sometimes we may meet people who say God is energy. We can say, yes, He is, but He is also a person as well. And we will see later on, as we go into the, this Ishopanishad, Later on we will come to some mantras where the prayer is to reveal this personality, that we want to see this form, this personality behind the energy. Just like there's a sun planet, so within the sun planet there's a sun god. Now we see the sunlight, but if we want to see the sun god, you have to go into the sun planet. And you have to have the proper body to go in there. You'd have to have a fire body to go in there to see the sun god. But within the sun planet, there is a sun god. So it's like that. So there, with the sun, there's the sunlight, and there is also the sun planet, and there's also the sun god. Surya, Surya Bhagwan, right? So God is both personal and impersonal. This is important for us. And Prabhupada says, without this inconceivable power, then it cannot be the Supreme Lord. He has, he has to have this inconceivable power. Okay, so important points to remember, this inconceivable potency. This is to show the nature of the Supreme Lord. We'll go ahead. Somebody can read the next paragraph.
Yes? Can I read my heart? Please. Uh, we should not take it for granted that just because we cannot see God with our eyes, the Lord does not have a personal existence. Sri Isopanisat refutes this argument by warning us that the Lord is far away but very near also. The airport of the Lord is beyond the material sky and we have no means to measure even this material sky. If the material sky extends too far, so far, then what to speak of the spiritual sky which is altogether beyond it? That the spiritual sky is situated far, far away from the material universe is also confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 15, text 6. But despite the Lord's being so far away, He can at once, within less than a second, descend before us with the speed swifter than the mind or the wind. He can also walk so swiftly that no one can surpass him. This has already been described in the previous world. So Prabhupada begins here that we cannot see God with our eyes. So people often ask us like that, that, oh, you believe in God? And then we we'll say, have you ever seen God? How will we respond to that? What will you say if somebody says to you, have you seen God? What would you say, Prabhu? Someone like to answer? Anybody? Have you seen God? You have not seen Him? How do you know He's there? How do you know He exists? You haven't seen Him. You feel the presence. Oh, how do you know this feeling is real? How do you know you're not just bewildering yourself or fooling yourself? Yes, somebody else? Marriages, what do you say? Marriage, can I try? Yeah, you can try. Go ahead. Actually, we cannot see God because we have no qualification to see Him. Oh, but, but the Lord is so merciful that He came in the in Vigraha form for us to be able to see Him and serve Him. Okay. Yeah, we're not qualified to see Him. Can you can you give an example about that? What kind of example would we give? We have, uh, can we talk about the four defects that we have? Well, I, I would give a simple example, just like I may say, you know, in Malaysia, you have your leader of the country, Mr. Mahathir. So I may say, I don't believe Mr. Mahathir exists. I've never seen him. I want to see him. If he's real, then I want to see him. So if I go to the government offices and I go and say, I want to see Mr. Mahathir, I don't believe he exists, I want to see him. Will they let me see him? No. Why not? I don't believe he's real, I want to see him. Why won't they let me see him? Huh? Because, because we haven't got the qualification to see him. Right. They say, no, don't, you, you go away, you're nobody, you're not an important person. The, the Prime Minister is a very busy man. He has a lot to do. He can't just meet every Tom, Dick and Harry who doesn't believe in him, who wants to see him. 
you know, he's a busy man, he's a very important man, he can't waste his time meeting insignificant, unimportant people like me, right? But, if I know the secretary of Mr. Mahathir, if I somehow I know his secretary, then he could introduce me. He could take me and he can introduce me. So in the same way, we want to understand, we want to see God, you have to be guided, you have to be introduced, you have to get, you have to take the spiritual master and the spiritual master is like the secretary of God and he can introduce us, he can bring us, he can deliver us to God. So that's one example Prabhupada gives. Another time, Prabhupada said, what, what, he would say, there's only one qualification to see God. Who knows that qualification? Anybody? What's the qualification to see God? We could have money again, mm, That's not exactly correct. Prabhupada says, you have to have love for God. When our eyes are full of love of God, then we can see God. And Prabhupada quotes a verse from the Brahma Samhita about Primanjana Charita Bhakti Vilochanina. We have to put the ointment, just like the young child, mother will put the ointment around the eyes of the child. So in the same way, we have to put the ointment of Prem, Prema Bhakti on our eyes. Then we can see God. Then we will see God. <laughs> so we can, we can argue like that. And, but some other times, Prabhupada would, when people say, oh, you haven't seen God, Prabhupada would say, why you give so much importance to seeing? Why can't you hear? about Him. He's speaking to us. The Bhagavad Gita, He's speaking to Why you always have to see everything? Try to hear. He's speaking for, to us and He's telling us. Like that we can see God. We can also give examples uh, we can see, who has not seen God? You see the light of the sun, you see the taste, you taste the water. You, there are so many ways God's present in His impersonal feature through the different objects or phenomena of the material world. Krishna says, I am the taste in water, the light of the sun and the moon, the syllable Om in the Vedic mantras. I am the intelligence of the intelligent, of flowing rivers, I am the Ganga, of mountains, I am Meru, of immovable things, I am the Himalayas, of beasts, I am the lion. In so many different ways Krishna describes how He is present in this world. We have to use our eyes to see, and we have to see through the scriptures, with the eye of knowledge, then we can see Krishna with the eye of knowledge, not with our mundane eyes, right? As the, as the Maharaji said, we have imperfect senses, so how can we see God? Our eyes are so limited. God is so great that in the Muslim philosophy, the Islam people, they say God is so big you can't get far away from Him to see Him can't get far away enough to see Him. So He's bigger than the biggest, but at the same time He's also smaller than the smallest. He's there within the atom. So like this, we have to understand this inconceivable potency of God. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone else like to read? Yes? Yet, when the Personality of Godhead, this part. Prabhu, you want to read more? Myself, Maharaj? Yeah. 
Yeah, okay. Yet when the personality of Godhead comes before us, we neglect him. Such foolish negligence is condemned by the Lord in Bhagavad Gita, wherein the Lord says that the foolish deride him when they consider him to be a mortal being. Chapter 9, text 11. He is not a mortal being, nor does he come before us with a body produced of material nature. There are many so-called scholars who contend that the Lord descends in a body made of matter, just like an ordinary living being. Not knowing his inconceivable power, such foolish men place the Lord on a level equal to that of ordinary man. Thank, thank you. So, uh, Pra Prabhupada is establishing here how when the Lord comes, he doesn't come with an ordinary material body. Can someone give an example to support this? How could we tell people that Krishna is not an, a mortal being? Can, can someone tell us how he takes birth? One of the ladies? Yes. Yes? Yes. One of the ladies, tell us. Krishna is not born. He appears in this world. Okay. How do you know that? From the scriptures. How did he appear? What did he appear like? For Aunt Krishna. Huh? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear what you said. Please say again. What did you say? For armed Vishnu. Okay, for armed Vishnu, right. When at the time of Krishna's birth, he appears as for armed Vishnu, right? Was he naked like most babies when they're born? No. How? How did he appear? Full of opulence. Full of opulence, fully dressed, with ornaments. Nice clothing, beautiful cloth and turban, everything, jewelry, everything. He was revealing to Vasudev and Devaki that he's the Lord, that he's come as their son. So he does not have a, a mortal body. So he did not take birth like us. We did not choose where we could take our birth. We were forced by the laws of karma. We were put into a particular situation, a particular family, a particular country. Right? We are born like that by our karma. But Krishna, he he can choose where he will take his birth. So where does he appear? What kind of family will he come in? Yadu dynasty. Huh? The Yadu dynasty? Why? Why come in the Yadu dynasty? Why does he take his? Why did he come in that as the son of Vasudev and Devaki? What were they qualified? What was their qualification? They were devotees, Maharaj. Yes, they're devotees. Right, Krishna. He's only going to come for his devotees. He will come in in the family, yeah, take birth in, because Vasudev and Devaki. Well, one thing is. They had done austerities to get the Lord as their child for three births, right? So this was the third birth he was coming. Previously he had come as their child as Prishni and Sutapa, and then previously as Aditi and Kashyapa, and now as Vasudev and Devaki he's coming, the third birth. So that because they're devotees, Krishna comes. He comes in the 
family of his very, very special devotees, not ordinary, very great devotees, pure devotees. And he comes fully dressed and decorated, although he appeared in the prison house of Kamsa. So he is not a mortal being, meaning he does not die. Now some people argue, they say, no, Krishna died. It's not true. It's not right. They're wrong. They've been misled. They haven't been taught properly. Because he does not come with a material body. What kind of body does he come with then? Spiritual body. Okay, what is, what's a spiritual body? What's it? What's it? Nature. Sachitananda. Yes. Thank you. What's the English? Full of bliss, knowledge, and eternal. Yes, eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. His his form is like that. So he does not die. He he didn't take birth like an ordinary, and he doesn't die like an ordinary person. But he appears in this world for some time, and then he leaves the world also. So, uh, Prabhupada writes that there are many so-called so scholars who say Krishna comes with a material body. They don't understand his nature, because Krishna can only be understood by how do we understand Krishna? By, be, by knowledge? By being a scholar? What's the qualification? To become his devotee? Yes, we have to become a devotee. That's the qualification. Only by devotion Krishna can be understood, right? And so Krishna, while he was in this world, he did many things to show that he's not an ordinary person. Would you like to tell me some of the things he did? He lifted Govardhana Hill. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. He picked up the Govardhana Hill. How, how did he pick it up? With which hand? How did he pick it up? With the fish he left in my life. The little finger? Yes, little finger. the little finger of the left hand. And how long did he hold it up for? Seven, seven days. And nights. Seven yeah, days. seven days and nights, right. So, you know, he's not an ordinary person. Any other things he did? Dancing on top of the Kaliya serpent. Okay, he danced on the hoods of the Kaliya serpent told Kaliya to leave the Yamuna, go on a, some other place, not to bother the Yamuna, not to trouble the people of Vrindavan. Mm -hmm. to, to put uh, Brahma in illusion by, kid, by one cut, when Brahma kidnapped all the children, oh. uh, gopis and the cows. Okay. Yeah, even the demigods, powerful demigods. So we heard how Indra was humble when Krishna picked up the Govardhan hill. In the same way, Brahma was also humbled when Krishna uh, showed his power to Brahma. And Brahma was thinking he was powerful, but Krishna was so much more powerful than Brahma. Hmm. Maharaj, Krishna killed Putana when he was a baby. Okay, yes. Putana. Who was Putana? Who was she? She's a demon. Oh. So Krishna Krishna killed a woman, huh? Yes. But what kind of woman? She was a demon, huh? Yes, Maharaj. Right. Yes, she killed many small children. She was very sinful. And she came to try to kill Krishna. So what did Krishna do with her? Suck the life air from the demon. Yeah, I took out. But it, 
Uh, he gave a liberation marriage. Yes, where? To where? For spiritual world. Yeah, what's she going to do there in the spiritual world? Selfish. Yeah, she's going to be his nurse in the spiritual world. Krishna thought, oh, because Putana disguised herself like a gopi, you know, she disguised herself to look like a gopi and she came in there and she came in, you know, and she's pretending and she picked up baby Krishna and she wanted to feed Krishna. So Krishna thought, oh, she wants to be a gopi, she wants to be a devotee, she wants to be a mother, she wants to nurse me. So Krishna arranged, take her to the spiritual world, let her be a nurse there, she can be my nurse there in the spiritual world. So this is Krishna's mercy on everyone, on Putana anyway. Maharaj, can I ask a question, uh, doubt Maharaj? Yes, please. How to explain um, in, uh, when uh, Lord Krishna, uh, uh, what is uh, Lila's in the earth, he was killed by a hunter. So that uh, a layman uh, friend asked me, he was killed by a mere hunter, how come? So he is an ordinary human being. Yes, right. This is it, how the, 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 the non-devotees understand. They heard that Krishna was killed by a hunter. It's a long story, but what happened anyway, this hunter, he got this arrow and he fired it and it said the arrow and entered the foot of Krishna. And it said when the arrow entered the foot of Krishna, Krishna died. Now, this is a puzzling thing. The, the, the people usually die when you get hit in the foot, but they say like this, they say that Krishna got pierced by the arrow in the foot, fired by this hunter, and Krishna died. And they even say there was a body, and the, they cremated the body, and the ashes are put there, and there's a, a tomb there, and they say this is where the ashes of Krishna are. But what the devotees explain is actually Krishna played a trick on all the non-devotees. He tricked them because Krishna has so many powers, he can do all tricks, he can do many amazing things. So he wanted to finish, it came time for him to finish his pastimes in this world. So Krishna has to arrange for a way in which he can leave the world. So he arranged like this, that this hunter came and he fired the arrow into the foot. So Krishna arranged for another body which looked like him, not a spiritual body, but a material body, which was like a replica of him, but it was an ordinary material body. And Krishna arranged for that body to be there. And so the non-devotees, they found that body and they thought, oh, Krishna has been killed, Krishna is dead. And then they cremated the body and they put that, and they thought this was Krishna. They didn't understand Krishna played a trick just because Krishna has a spiritual body, so he wanted to disappear from everyone. So he arranged for this ordinary body, for a, 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 a dummy body, which is not actually him, but it's a replica of him, it looked like him. And he arranged for that body to be there, and that body was cremated and put in, the ashes were put into the ground. So in this way, people thought, oh, Krishna is dead. But the devotees, they know, they know the truth. They know Krishna doesn't have a material body. There's no way Krishna dies. He doesn't get old. He doesn't, he, he's not, so many people came to fight him with different weapons. They tried to harm him. Nobody could do any harm to him. We see when Krishna was in Vrindavan, sometimes there would be a forest fire. What would Krishna do? 
when there's a forest fire, what would happen? Be swallowed? Yeah. All the, when the forest fire would come, all the people, the bridge basket people would all come to Krishna, oh Krishna save us, and Krishna would just tell them, close your eyes, and Krishna would swallow the whole forest fire and deli save everyone. No, this is Krishna. He's the Supreme Lord. He can do all of these wonderful things. How could you ever think he could be killed by an arrow in the foot? <laughs> it's ridiculous. But Krishna used it just to trick the non-devotees. And he left the body, another body there, and so people thought, oh, Krishna's dead, see, Krishna's dead. No, oh, his body is not material. So we have to understand his power, his inconceivable nature. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. May I know for the for this question, um, where can we read about it? To read about what? Is there about uh, how Krishna? Why is it Krishna is a, a, this trick that Krishna played on? Oh, the, okay. Yeah, you can read in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's there in the, I think it's the 11th canto or 12th canto. Yeah. Do you have a. Do Thank you, have, you Maharaj. Yeah. If you read the Srimad Bhagavatam, described there, the departure of Lord Krishna from this world. It's mentioned, there's a chapter, the, the Lord's departure from this world. It's either canto 11 or canto 12, I can't remember. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, so Krishna has inconceivable power. Foolish men, they think he's like an ordinary man. That's described in the Bhagavad Gita, right? You know the verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Anybody? Have you been studying Bhagavad Gita good? Krishna says, the foolish mock at me descending amongst them like an ordinary person. They do not know my transcendental nature and my supreme dominion over all that be. And so when you study the Bhagavad Gita more, then you will get to know how Krishna replies to these kind of people. Let's go ahead. Someone can read this next paragraph. Maraji, Jolene, you can read. Maharaj, I would like, I would like to read. Okay. Who, 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 what, 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 what's your name? I am Mary, Mary. Mary? Okay, Mary, go yeah. ahead. Okay. Because he is full of inconceivable potency, God can accept our service through any sort of medium, and he can convert his different potencies according to his own will. Non-believers argue either that the Lord cannot incarnate himself at all, or that if he does, he descends in a form of material energy. These arguments are nullified if we accept the existence of the Lord's inconceivable potencies. Then we will understand that even if the Lord appears before us in the form of material energy, it is quite possible for him to convert this energy into spiritual energy. Since the source of the energies is one and the same, the energies can be utilized according to the will of their source. For example, the Lord can appear in the form of the Archa Vigraha, a deity supposedly made of earth, stone or wood. Deity forms, although engraved from wood, stone or other matter are not idols, as the iconoclast content. Okay, thank you, Mary. So, Prabhupada is talking here about the power of the Lord, that He can convert material energy into spiritual energy, if He wants. Because He's the Supreme Lord, 
it's his energy, so he can change it if he wants. Just like all of us as devotees, we can also change material things into spiritual things, right? Do you know how to do that? Mary, do you know how to change material things into spiritual things? Uh, I, I don't know, Maharaja. <laughs> okay, you don't know? We'll, we'll tell you in a minute. We'll ask if anybody else knows. Some of our students... Yes? How, what? What did you say? We offer them to Krishna. Offer them to Krishna, right. The food, before we offer it, it's boga, right? But when we offer it, it becomes prasadam. The, devote, the, the devotees were doing a program, they said, come and see matter made into spirit. So many people came, they were all interested to see how we make matter into spirit. So the devotees made an altar, and then they brought a plate with the offering and they put it on the altar and then they got the bell and they bowed down and chanted the prayers and then they say, okay, now it's all spiritual. We change matter into spirit. Even devotees can do that by connecting it to Krishna, right? So certainly Krishna, he can also change ma matter into spirit. And Prabhupada gives the example about the deity. Now there are a class of people called iconoclasts. Iconoclasts. They claim that the deity, deity worship, that they're just, we're just worshipping idols. They say, they, th they think our deities have no life. They don't know that actually our deities have life. They, the deities, they can walk, they can talk, and they can eat, and they can do many things. They're, they're, they're not just statues, they're, they're deities, they're living forms of the Lord. Of course, they're made of material elements, but the Lord enters into the deity form and he makes that form of the Lord spiritual. And when we worship the Lord, the deity, with devotion, then we can understand these things. And there are many examples. The deity who stole the sweet rice, the deity who ate the offering, the deity who came as a witness for the marriage, the deity who was playing chess with the other devotee. There are so many pastimes of the de different deities, how they did these things. Of course, the deity only does these things for the very good devotees, very pure devotees. But we should understand that the deity is a person and he can hear and he can see. Sometimes we think, oh, they're, they're, they're just statues, but no, because we have invited Krishna to enter into that form. So it's mentioned, Archa Vigraha. Archa Vigraha means the Lord descends, he enters into it. The deity is like an incarnation of the Lord. Yes, the Lord has his incarnations. He comes at different times in different places. And one of the ways in which he comes is also as a deity. It's one of his incarnations. Okay? Is that difficult for, for you? Are you okay with this? Uh, yes, I, I'm okay. Uh, Mary, you're not... You're, yes, you get yes, it? I'm listening. Uh, I, I'm okay. Oh. My, my two kids are listening as well. They are, they are okay. Oh, wow. I enjoy the story, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because they watch a lot of this uh, uh, 
uh, pastime, Krishna pasta about Putana, and then swallowing the fire forest. Yes, right. Yeah, the, the swallow yeah. fire. No, but, uh, Kill the different demons. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me see. Okay, so we'll go on just to try to finish this. In our present state, someone can read. Mary, you want to read more? Ah, yes, okay. In our present state of imperfect material existence, we cannot see the Supreme Lord due to imperfect vision. Yet, those devotees who want to see Him by means of material vision are favored by the Lord, who appears in a so-called material form to accept His devotee service. One should not think that such devotees who are in the lowest stage of devotional service are worshipping an idol. They are factually worshipping the Lord, who has agreed to appear before them in an approachable way. Nor is the archa form fashioned according to the whims of the worshipper. This form is eternally existent with all paraphernalia. This can be actually felt by a sincere devotee, but not by an atheist. Okay, thank you. So, Prabhupada is describing more about this process of deity worship. That this deity worship can only really be understood by the devotees. People who are atheistic, they, they cannot understand. They, they come and they think, oh, just some statues. They, they wonder what, why we give so much care and attention. They don't understand that the Lord actually enters in to these different forms. And he, he enters into this form to accept the service of the devotees. Because we like to see the Lord. We like to serve Him. So the Lord appears in this way to give us the opportunity that we can serve Him. Just like we serve. We, we change the dress and we give the flower garland every day and then we cook food for the Lord also throughout the day and then we offer the arti and we perform the kirtan. All of these things are done for the pleasure of the Lord. And even the classes which go on in the temple room also, those are also for the pleasure of the deity that the deity takes pleasure in hearing all of these things being discussed. So ordinary people, they think we are worshipping an idol. But Prabhupada said, no, he said, actually, the for this form of the deity, this is according to scripture. It's idols are something which you, we, we just imagine. We, we have no scriptural reference to them or anything, but the form of the deity is all described, ancient scriptures, the exact form, the exact proportions of the deity by which the deities are made. So nothing is just by chance, it's, it's all a very ancient science. And by worshipping this deity, we actually develop more love for Krishna. We come and see the deity and, and, and the deity can even take care of his devotee. There's a pastime, there was one man, he had no son. So the, he was told, you worship the deity as your son. You take a form of Krishna to be your son. So the man and his wife, they had a form of Krishna and they arranged for Krishna's marriage, just like if you have a son, you get your son married. So the same way this couple, they had arranged the marriage for the deity. And, and then when they died, when the couple died, the deity came and did the funeral for them, arranged their, for their burn, burning of their body. Just like the son, he takes the responsibility to do the cremation of the father. So the deity, because the deity had been the son of the man, so the deity came to perform the funeral, the, sac the, the cremation of the man. So this is only understood by devotees who have great faith. 
those who don't have faith, very difficult for them to understand. Go ahead. In the Bhagavad Gita, someone else like to read? Yeah, please. In the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 4, text 11, the Lord says that how we treat this devotee depends on the devotee's degree of surrender. The Lord reserves the right not to reveal himself to anyone and everyone, but to show himself only to those souls who surrender unto him. Thus, for the surrendered soul, he is always within reach, whereas for the unsurrendered soul, he is far, far away and cannot be approached. Okay, so Krishna is saying, surrender is very important. And for one who is surrendered, then Krishna is very near. But for those who are not surrendered, then it's far away, very hard, very hard to understand. Very, he does, Krishna doesn't care much for them. He has a special interest in his devotees because they've surrendered to him. So he has a special feeling for them. Go ahead, please keep reading. In this connection, two books, the Divine Scriptures, often apply to the Lord. Saguna, with qualities, and Nirguna, without qualities, are very important. The word Saguna does not imply that when the Lord appears with perceivable qualities, He must take on a material form and be subject to the laws of material nature. For Him, there is no difference between the material and spiritual energies because He is the source of all energies. As the controller of all energies, he cannot at any time be under their influence, as we are. The material energy works according to his direction. Therefore, he can use that energy for his purposes without ever being influenced by any of the qualities of that energy. In this sense, he is nirguna, without qualities. Nor does the Lord become a formal entity at any time, for ultimately he is the eternal form, the primeval Lord. His impersonal aspect or Brahman effulgence is but the glow of his personal rays, just as the sun's rays are the glow of the sun god. Okay, so an important point Prabhupada is bringing up this, these terms saguna and nirguna. Saguna meaning with qualities and nirguna without qualities. So Saguna means the Lord has qualities, but Prabhupada makes the point that not material qualities, but spiritual qualities. And for Krishna, there's no difference between material and spirit. But everything in, about Krishna is spiritual, of course, his quality, spiritual. So. He, he has qualities, but not qualities of the material world, like us. And then nirguna means without qualities. So Prabhupada explains in what way Krishna is nirguna, that he becomes... Uh, it doesn't mean that he, he's without any form. People think, oh, if he's without qualities, then he won't have any form. But no, he has a form, but... It's not like our form. It's uh, the, the Lord uh, Prabhupada describes it. He's he's not influenced by any of the qualities. That's the point. The material nature works according to his direction. Therefore, he can use that energy for his purposes without ever being influenced by any of the qualities of that energy. In that sense, he is nirguna, without quality. So people think nirguna, no form, they like this idea, no form. They want to give up, because they think, oh, if he has a form, he must have a form like I have a form. And I know all the trouble I have with my form, uh, you know, I'm getting old, and I'm getting diseased, and I'm getting so many problems with my form, with my body. But, better to be without a form, we think. 
And we think if Krishna has a form, he would also be like that. No, we know Krishna was in this world for more than a hundred years and he still looked just like a young man. He didn't age. He didn't age past the point of youth. He was always like Nabha Yovana, eternally youthful. So Krishna is not subject to the deterioration of, like we are in the material world. Everything deteriorates with time. But Krishna is not subject to that. He is therefore nirguna. But he has a form. But it's not of this world. Okay, we'll go ahead. Someone read? Hare Krishna Manas. Yes. Please. When the child, Saint Pranath Maharaj, was in the presence of his, uh, his father, his father asked him, Where is your God? When Pranath replied, That God resides everywhere. The father angrily asked whether his God was within one of the pillars of the palace. And the child said, yes, and one the Atis king shattered the pillar in front of it, him to peace, and the Lord instantly appeared as Nashima, the half-man, half-lion incarnation, the king, the Atis king. Thus the Lord is within everything, and is create everything by his different energy, through his inconceivable power, he can appear at any place in order to favor his sincere devotee. Lord Nashima appeared from within the pillar, not by the order of the, this king, but by the pitch of this devotee, Radha. As a this cannot order the Lord to appear, but the Lord will appear anywhere and everywhere to show mercy to his devotee. The Bhagavad Gita 4.8 similarly state that the Lord appeared in order to vanquish non-believers and protect believers. Of course, the Lord has sufficient energies and against who can vanquish at this, but he placed him to personally favor a devotee. Therefore, the descent as an incarnation actually he descend only to favor his devotee, not for any other purpose. Thank you, Madhiji. Thank you very nice. Okay, so Prabhupada is explaining about how the Lord appeared in this particular pastime, how he came from the pillar. So he's everywhere, he's within everything. So the, the demon father, Hiranyakashipu, was asking Prahlad, where is your God? because the father was a big atheist and Prahlad was a devotee. So he was asking Prahlad, where is this God? And Prahlad was saying, he's everywhere, Father. Because Prahlad was a, a good devotee, he saw God everywhere, within everything. So then his father said, is he in this pillar? And then Lord Nishingadev came out from the pillar. So he actually came from there. But it's not that he only can come from the pillar. Some different incarnations appear from different places. Can you think of some other incarnations? Where did they come from? Where did Lord Varaha come from? From the nostril of Brahma? Yes. Lord Varaha appeared from the nostril of Lord Brahma. He came, at first he appeared very small, but then he grew very quickly to a gigantic form. And, and w other incarnations, where do they come from? Just like we said Lord Krishna, he came from Devaki Vasudev, right? And we have also Kapila Muni, he came from the womb of Devahuti from the semen of Kashyapa, uh, Kadama, Devahuti. So the Lord can appear in many different ways, many different places. But he descends, as, it's, as Prabhupada said, he descends to favor his devotees. 
Yeah, to kill the demons, he doesn't need to come just for that. He can do that without coming. His real purpose in coming is to give pleasure to the devotees. That's his real business. Okay, we'll just go ahead. Someone read now? In Brahma Samhita? Can I read Guru Maharaj? Yes, please. In the Brahma Samhita, chapter 5, text 35, it is said that Govinda, the primeval Lord, enters everything by his plenary portion. He enters the universe as well as all the atoms of the universe. He is outside in his Virat form and he is within everything as Antaryami, Antaryami. As Antaryami, he witnesses everything that is going on and he awards us the results of our actions as Karma Pala. We ourselves may forget what we have done in previous lives, but because the Lord witnesses our actions, the results of our actions are always there and we have to undergo the reactions nonetheless. Go ahead. The fact is that there is nothing but God within and without. Everything is a manifestation of his different energies, like the heat and light emanating from a fire. And in this way, there is a oneness among his diverse energies. Although there is oneness, however, the Lord is, the Lord in his potential form, still enjoys unlimitedly all the pleasures enjoyed minutely by the tiny part and parcel living entities. Okay, so Prabhupada introduces an important term for us, antaryami. Antaryami meaning the one who is witnessing everything. In other words, the super soul, or sometimes we simply say paramatma, right? The witness. He sees everything. And because he's seeing everything, we get the results. So sometimes we think, oh, I'm doing something, nobody knows, nobody saw me. But Krishna witnesses, he's there in the heart of everyone, in the form of the antaryami, and he sees everything, and we get the results. We think nobody knows what I'm doing, but Krishna knows, we cannot cheat him. And so we get the reactions that comes in the form of our karma. So Prabhupada said he's within the he's within the atom and he is also outside in everything as in the virat form the virat form meaning that's like the the universal form the virata form the the universal form all the different elements of material creation so we can understand the lord in these different ways Prabhupada saying that everything, there's nothing but God within and without. It's all His energy. We have to see Him everywhere. And then Prabhupada talks about the oneness. And in this way there is a oneness among His energy. Although, although there is oneness, the Lord in His personal form still enjoys unlimitedly all the pleasures enjoyed minutely by the tiny parts. So the Lord enjoys this relationship with His devotees. Just as we as devotees enjoy, the Lord is a person, He is the supreme enjoyer. We are tiny enjoyers. He is the supreme enjoyer. Okay, so we'll go on tomorrow. Thank you very much. If you have any more questions, please keep them for tomorrow. And you, or you can post them, send them to us. Okay, Prabhus, thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Hare Krishna